Hello, hello, welcome back to this season 13, episode 29 of the Ubuntu podcast. It's Tuesday, the 6th of October. And today we're going to be discussing community news and events and news headlines. And with me to discuss all those wonderful things are Mark. Hello, hello. Hello, how you doing? I'm not too bad, thanks. I'm very pleased to hear it. And Alan. Hello. How are you? I'm okay. (laughs) Yeah, you just sound okay, but sound a little bit Marvin this evening. Okay, yes. (laughs) Yes, the diodes down my left-hand side are a little bit painful, yes. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, I tell you what, have you been up to anything uh, since we last spoke that may be be uplifting for you? Yes. Uh, I have an ever so slightly cleaner house, thanks to a new house guest whose name is Harvey. Oh. And he is a robot vacuum cleaner. Um, <laughs> and he uh, he traverses the floor in various rooms in the house, picking up dead skin cells, dust, hair, <laughs> cat vomit, whatever, and uh, keeps it in a little plastic box. And then I go and empty that little plastic box on a periodic basis. And this makes me happy. This is an uplifting thing. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm not sure who I feel more sorry for, Harvey having to collect all of that disgusting collection of stuff, or you having to empty out his box where he's been, uh, you know, aggregating uh, all of this. I decided a little while ago that I needed one of these things, and I had a chat to a good friend of the show, Will Cook, who has one, mm-hmm. and he went traipsing off around his house videoing his uh, doing <laughs> stuff and sent me videos of his thing and explaining how it works and how good it is and i bought exactly the same model and um it arrived and i plugged it all in and it's got a physical remote control like a like a tv like a small remote control and it's got an app and you can and it's got a big button on it and you can just walk over to it and just press the button on the top and it'll just start hoovering or you could use the app if you want to or you could use a remote control and it means that there was a a certain amount of detritus underneath my sofa <laughs> and that is now gone you could eat your dinner off the underneath of my sofa now it is that wow clean. that that okay. would be a trick yes <laughs> so have you have you had to rescue it from any unfortunate situations uh it turns out yes um <laughs> but these these robots are not particularly clever and they become stranded sometimes and i get little notification messages <laughs> on my phone telling me when he's stranded or if he can't if he can't figure out the way back to the charger, because he, he, he trundles back can't to the charging point. Out the way to the charger. Yeah, and the charger, I mean, you guys both know the layout of my house. He's in yes. the lounge, the, yeah. in the corner of the lounge is where the charger is. And he goes trundling off out into the dining room, through the kitchen, out into the bathroom and into my bedroom downstairs. And it's all like mostly wooden or, you know, it's flat floor um, and the lounge is carpet. So he can traverse all of this stuff. And... uh yeah, and usually he makes his way back, but sometimes he gets a bit stuck. Like sometimes <laughs> the door will slide shut behind him. And he'll be stuck in a room looking around going, hang on a minute, <laughs> I can't find my way back to my charging point. And he'll send me a little notification. It's, oh, it's he does? Cute. Okay. Yes, and, yes. And is Harvey a brand name or an affectionate pet name that you have given this um, assistant? It's a pet name. He's named after Harvey Keitel. Mm. I did wonder. Who uh, plays the part of a cleaner in <laughs> cleaner, Pulp Fiction. right. I was going to ask that question at the outset, there, but I there thought is, it couldn't There is no itty bits of brain that he needs to clean up, though, or uh, or blood all over the back of a car. No, thankfully. no, he's it's, got cat vomit to deal no, with. Yes. Altogether a different... <laughs> yes. Wow. Okay. Um, Mark, have you been uh, adding robot assistance to your home this week? I have not. I have been adding games to my gaming collection. Ooh. Ah, I'm not going to ask, even but is guess? it? <laughs> uh, th- this week I've been, I are mostly be playing Hades, which is uh, a a roguelike game. You will be completely unsurprised <laughs> here. <laughs> but of course it is. This is from Supergiant Games, who made uh, Bastion, which oh. got quite popular from one of the early Humble Bundles, I think. Um and it's a similar sort of uh, style, isometric, hand-drawn style um, with... Uh, it's an uh, interesting roguelike because it's uh, got a strong storytelling element. You're playing um, the son of Hades, Lord of the Dead, 
and you've decided that uh, you've had enough of living in the underworld and you're going to get out but um there's no way out for the dead so you are fighting your way through the legions and uh, every time you die you go back to the start because you're where dead people belong in the first place uh-huh. and but but each time that you start again there's um you start in the house of hades and there's people there who you chat to and um as the as you get further and further the story progresses and the people you meet and defeat are back there because they died as well and you know there's there's quite a lot of humor to it and quite a lot of uh, greek mythology uh, wrapped up in it it's uh, it's a lot of fun it's very stylish. I, I like the uh, cartoon style and the neon colours as well. Yeah. It's very bright and vivid, but very cartoony at the same time. Mm. It reminds me a bit of um, Thundercats for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why, but yeah. And the the reviews show as overwhelmingly positive. Yes. So that's good. I know. I'm playing a good game. Who'd have thought? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm aware of this game um, because... About three years ago, we did a story about Jim Sterling and his copyright deadlock oh, yes. that he discovered. Yes, yes, we did. And ever since then, I've been a subscriber to his YouTube channel and, in fact, his Patreon as well. He reviewed this game this week, and he doesn't just think this is his game of 2020, but he puts it in his top three games of all time. Oh, wow. And wax lyrical about it and said it's just a wonderful game. And I think he's played it through multiple times and was talking about the fact you can play it through many yeah. times over and yeah. take different routes through the game and different choices. And How many hours have you clocked up yet, Mark? Oh, um, I've probably... I played about 15 hours so oh, far wow. and I bought it at the weekend. Oh gosh. <laughs> okay. Uh, wow, okay. Great. So that's quite a lot. Yeah. And how much was it just out of interest? Uh, I can't remember about 20 quid. I think I got it on the okay. switch. I think it's about the same on steam as well. Okay. So you're playing it on the switch, but it is also available on steam. No yeah. idea if it works in proton or not. So any adventurous listeners who get that, let us know if it works or not. That is tremendous value for money, really, yes. when you think about it. 20 quid and you've already clocked up 15 hours. Yeah. Games never cease to amaze me at how much, you know, you can invest. It feels like you're investing a chunk of money, but actually the amount of value you get out of mm. it is tremendous. Yeah, you make a good point. I always equate the amount you spend on a game to the number of pound coins I would have put into an arcade machine and the number of hours of uh, fun and entertainment I would have got out of like depositing yeah. coins into an arcade cabinet. I, I compare it to going to the cinema and buying a hot dog. And uh, <laughs> if, if it can compete with that, then brilliant. Yeah, Brilliant. Right, enough hot dog nonsense. Let's get on with the community news and events. <laughs> So, Alan, what did you find in the community news this week? Well, friend and colleague Marcus Tomlinson wrote a post on the Ubuntu Discourse about a new feature coming to the Ubuntu desktop. And I didn't really know anything about this until he shared a video and a little description of what it is. And I think, if I understand this correctly, um, the problem that they're trying to solve is that sometimes if you install a snap... Um, of a graphical application, the theme doesn't look right. It might not match the theme that you may have personally selected on your desktop. So -hmm. if you've gone off-piste and chosen a new and interesting style for your desktop, the application doesn't look right. And this looks like it tries to fix that by auto-magically downloading the theme and applying it somehow to that snap to make it look right and consistent with the rest of your desktop. Right. Yes, that's the basic idea. So the way that this works is you have decided you want to choose foo theme and you put foo theme on and then you run a snap and it looks uh, like the default add waiter theme where the rest of your desktop looks like foo. And what this does is if you if somebody has published a snap of the foo theme, it will automatically see that this theme is available as a snap and automatically go and install it and apply it so that your snapped applications now match the rest of your desktop environment. Neat. There's a little bit of integration work to go, but this has been a long time coming and one of those sort of um, rough edges that, you know, snaps have have had for a while and uh, there's some great work going on here. So coming to a desktop near you soon. Mark, what did you find? 
Well, OMG Ubuntu has reported that Groovy Gorilla now has its new default wallpaper. And it's a very Groovy Gorilla indeed. Yes. So it it has the mascot, <laughs> for <laughs> it, sure. <laughs> it does. Yes, no no laser beams like no laser beams. Um, coming out of his eyes. In fact, but, uh, well, quite you the opposite. Can't even, yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> they may be coming out of his eyes, but they're blocked by his Ubuntu-branded uh, tinted shades. Yeah, I need a pair of them. <laughs> I hope they'll be yes. in, the, in the merch store. So this is indeed the Groovy Gorilla mascot, uh, which doesn't feature in the desktop images yet. So uh, mm. we'll be adding that in the next couple of days. Mm. And by the time you listen to this, uh, head on over to the Ubuntu discourse, because I'll be posting a full set of the wallpapers, coloured and grayscale, and the mascot himself as an SVG, so that you can make your own derivative wallpapers from it as well. Does the mascot have a name this time? Uh, well, Gerald? none that I've heard. I mean, it could be. I mean, there is a gorilla called Gerald, isn't there? Yeah, we we haven't always named them. They, <laughs> they haven't always had names. The last one did, but yeah, I think we need, we need to get uh, audience participation on this one and come up with a name for it's got to be a sufficiently groovy name for a gorilla yeah so here you go listeners show at ubuntupodcast.org <laughs> or at ubuntu podcast on twitter send us your ideas for names for our groovy gorilla speaking of which martin there's another news story on that uh yes the uh groovy gorilla final beta has been released that's come around quick isn't it gosh hasn't it it's uh it's flown by so this is what will become ubuntu 20.10 uh which is due out uh, for release at the end of october and uh this features a linux 5.8 kernel and gnome 3.38 and from uh the desktop team uh active directory enrollment is available in the installer what does that mean so if you are at work or at home for that matter and uh, you have an active directory domain that you authenticate against you can now choose to authenticate your, against your active directory rather than creating a local user account is that a new thing that we've never had before brand new oh coming to 20.10 for the first time and uh, we will be uh backporting that to a 2004 point release in the future as well a much requested feature from our enterprise customers mm, interesting so now's a good time to uh, try out 2010 with it being beta before the final release i guess yeah we're into the like the last three weeks now so now's a really good time to go and grab a beta or if you're you know like to be on the rolling edge of things upgrade your 2004 to uh, 2010 um, you'll find details of how to do that in the beta release notes that are linked in the show notes i've upgraded all of my machines to 2010 it's a cracking release actually i've it does feel faster it feels a bit snippier i try and avoid saying snappier because that implies <laughs> other things so yeah it's a bit more snippy yeah, I've been I've been getting random bits of feedback from people in the community, and they seem to like this one a lot. So uh, mm. uh, I think we're I think we're in a good place. Good. Uh, what else did you find in the news this week? Not only did I find, but I wrote this. So, oh my um, goodness! <laughs> yeah, I uh, I've added a th uh, a pointer in here because I, I want to widen uh, the attention to this post that I made on the Snapcraft forum. Um, you may be aware that the uh, graphical desktop um software storefront which goes under very very uh, numerous names including gnome software ubuntu software and snap store uh, there's an editor's picks section in there which highlights nine or so applications that you know we think we want to draw your attention to and previously it was basically me martin and igor who would pick and choose what would go in that list and we decided, why don't we just crowdsource this and ask the community what applications they think should be featured in that in that list? Um, and I I started a thread over on the Snapcraft forum because these are snaps, and so that felt like the right place to do it. But I wanted to get wider attention to this post. Uh, we did it two weeks ago, and it was successful. Loads of suggestions, some suggestions from people who like particular applications and want you know other want to share it with other people. 
and also suggestions from developers or publishers of applications. So people who've published somebody else's game or people who've written their own software and published it in the store and they want to raise the profile of it. We go through and curate the list and then we update the editor's picks on the Friday. So I started that th a second thread, Monday just gone, and this Friday we'll close that thread, gather up all the suggestions, figure out which ones are appropriate, which ones might not be, and we'll provide feedback for those that aren't. And for those that are, they get put forward to um, be featured. And it's useful because it it raises the profile of these applications. Like some of them get quite a jump in installs. There's one that I published that happened to be listed, uh, not because I chose it, somebody else did. And that one quadrupled in user base in a week after being featured. And another one that's got a slightly larger user base already jumped by 40%. Uh, number of users just by being featured in the store. So it's quite useful for developers to get more users, but it's also useful for users to be able to discover new software that they didn't know about. And and you met you know you talk about forty percent uplift. We've known this for some time that when when we feature something in the store, publishers tell us, "Hey, I've now got loads more users than I had two weeks ago." Which is interesting because as power users, you know, snap install on the command line or apt install on the command line, we would be forgiven for thinking that's how everyone does it. But actually, it doesn't seem to be the case at all because the stuff that's featured in the store, we always see an uptick in adoption when uh, it appears in the uh, graphical storefront. Yeah. Weird. People on desktops use graphical storefronts. Who knew? Yeah, indeed. <laughs> so... I read with interest that a project that I was aware of from the past has been updated and had a significant update at that. I'm not sure how you pronounce this. It's either Touch Egg or Touche Egg. Um, uh, 2.0.1 has been released, and it's a means of exposing trackpad gestures in your Linux desktop. Uh, and it's had a significant update to uh, bring it up to spec with all of the capabilities and technologies that exist in desktop Linux today. Huh. This used to be called something else, I have a feeling. I think it was called something else and there was a trademark problem and it got <laughs> renamed to that. Touche, <laughs> touche, or touche, or touch egg, or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. I, I vaguely remember that from around the time of the phone project so yeah this has been around for a long while well the last time it had a significant update was 2011 gosh uh, it had a minor update in like 2015 um, but it's now been brought up to spec with lib input support which is how all of these touch devices um, you know interoperate these days and it's now got um, one to one animation so it um, this is something that you and I touched on a few years ago when I was implementing this stuff or prototyping it in Ubuntu Mate you were saying well if you start doing something can you like pause part way through and well this this is the implementation of that and it supports um, swipe and pinch gestures and then you can uh, map s different types of swipe and pinch gestures to maximizing windows, minimizing, closing, tiling, changing desktops, showing the desktop, or sending key macros or running commands. Oh, this is very nice. This would actually tie in very nicely with a tiling window manager, wouldn't it? It would rather, yes. Um, so uh, we'll have a link to the GitHub project in the show notes where in their releases page you will find a .deb file that you can install and try it out. I haven't tried it out. I've <laughs> read about it and it's on my list of things to do. I just haven't mm. got around to doing it yet. So I've just checked the repository and yep, you're right, it hasn't been touched for, for a little while and then there's been a flurry of activity and I'd like to retract everything I said about it being renamed of another project. I was wrong. It's not. Forget. <laughs> yeah, it's I said something that. else. That's okay. something else entirely. And Mark, uh, what did you uh, find in the news this week that might not be dead? Once again, Mia 2.1 is not dead. Among other things, it now works on the Raspberry Pi 4 uh, X11 applications can now be run in a confined desktop via X Wayland and a bunch of other bug fixes that come with implementing a brand new display stack. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I think the suggestion there is um, 
when you implement a brand new display stack, you're going to find bugs. Oh, I see. Like historical stuff doesn't work on this new display stack. And there's a whole load of X related stuff in here, like right. for X Wayland. The thing that caught my interest was the Pi 4, because I've tried mm. using mm. Uh, appliances with yeah. a full yeah. screen, you know, graphical environment. And I was doing it on a Pi 4 and it frustrated me that it, that it didn't work. So I'm glad they fixed that. So I'm going to have another go at running like maybe emulators and things like that full screen on a Raspberry Pi under Mir, which I think might be a fun thing to do. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, and astonishingly, we have events this week. So uh, Alan, what's the first ev- event that we've got here? The first one is a celebration. Uh, and it is that the Free Software Foundation is 35 years old. Good Lord. Mm, GNU Herd's nearly there. And they're having an anniversary. <laughs> Sorry, that was just an easy swipe to make. They're having an anniversary party on Friday, October the 9th, uh, at 12 Eastern. That's 4 o'clock UTC until 5 Eastern. That's 9 o'clock UTC in the FSF channel on Freenode IRC. Oh, there ain't no party like an IRC party. So oh my goodness. Uh, I think actually there's, there's going to be video presentations and stuff as well. Some pre-recorded, some live. Um, and they've got um, a website. I think it's fsf.org um, slash event slash FSF35 where you can find out more. We'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, but it's all part of the celebration of them, you know, being 35 years old and uh lobbying for freedom for the user for the, all those years and mark what have you found registration for the linux application summit is now open um so this is um an event i think we've spoken about it a few times before we have um yeah so this is bringing together people who want to make applications for the linux desktop basically in general it's not tied to um either KD or GNOME. It's a, a coming together of the communities of graphical Linux developers. Yep. Um, and I can probably tell you when it is, if I pay attention. Uh, <laughs> it is November the 12th to the 14th, uh, and it's online. You can find it at linuxappsummit.org. And finally, we have Mini DebConf. And it says here that Mini DebConf Online 2 a Gaming Edition is four days of Debianites working together to learn, have fun, and improve Debian. Why is it called Gaming Edition? I think they they um, focusing on how they can do things to improve gaming on Debian, basically. Huh. Okay. Yes. Uh, so we'll have a link to the show notes, and that will be taking place on the nineteenth to the twentieth of November. And their uh, call for papers is open now. And with that, let's move on. And we've moved on to this, the news headlines for grown-ups. Um, and I say for grown-ups, uh, yeah. my, my, my news, actually, no, this, this is news for grown-ups. This is news for old people. We had this discussion uh, a couple of weeks ago. So um, I'd like to say I found this myself, but I didn't. Alan, Alan found it for me, but I thoroughly approve. Uh, this is a project called Mock A65XX. And it's um, a project to design a universal 6502 CPU replacement. Um, So it's uh, to reverse engineer and create edge level exact replacements uh, for the MOS 6502 processors and its derivatives. What are they then? Awesome. (laughs) Is what they are. Pull up a chair, Mark. (laughs) Listen to the old people. (laughs) Let me tell is, this, you a story. is this one of those ones where we're playing um, vintage computer top trumps and you start arguing about which one's the better yes. processor? Yes. Right. Yes. That's yes. exactly this, what this happens. One, this one is the best processor. The one we're talking about right now is the one that always wins. This is the one that nobody uses anymore, whereas the Z80 is the one that's still manufactured and still in use. Yes. I have yes, several of them in computers behind me and they work fine. But what I like about this is that um, it enables you to um, improve implements a number of the 6502 family derivatives, including uh, the 6510, which was also known as the 8500, which is what was used in the Commodore 64. Um, so there, the 
creator of this project has got their first um, silicon prototypes or their final silicon prototypes that they're testing. And I was scouring the page looking for the buy it now button because I really <laughs> wanted one of these because earlier in the year I created a, uh, a Commodore 64 based on original silicon but a modern motherboard. And I also got some FPGA implementations of the SID chip and this would be great for those people that are struggling to find some of these old um, CPUs and what have you to actually, you know, bring um, old computers back to life. Um, so I'm very interested in getting one of these at some point and building a Commodore 64 with it. It's pretty funky. It's got little, not not jumpers, but like solder joints on the bottom that if you bridge the, the gaps, it changes the personality of the chip that's on the in the circuit so that you can you know pull the chip out and if you want it to be a different type of chip you can put a, a solder across two pads and then put it back in and it's a different processor it's pretty it's pretty cool and i looked at that very carefully and i came to the conclusion that even with my ropey soldering skills i think that is within the realm of possibility for me to uh, achieve that is minimum level soldering achievement really is. is smearing <laughs> solder between two pads <laughs> <laughs> so alan what did you find in the grown-up news this week well good and bad DigitalOcean has sponsored an online hack fest throughout october and the goal of this is to inspire new people to contribute to open source projects mm -hmm. and it's uh it's a regular thing they do and it's a month long and the goal is to um get people doing pull requests on uh, open source projects in places like GitHub and get people used to the tools, familiar with the tools, get people involved, get more people working in open source and generally raise the profile of open source and raise the profile of these applications. However, um, <laughs> they, they offer free swag, basically t-shirts for people who are successful at this. And the lure of a free t-shirt seems to have been a little bit too much for a lot of people and they've been uh creating what some people have said are useless and some people have said you know not super useful i mean some people have been very unkind about these pull requests that people have been making um because people have been doing low quality pull requests in order to qualify for a t-shirt some of them have been um putting boilerplate text on a page in a readme, updating the readme for a project. Some of them have been as little as adding a full stop to a sentence or adding a single line doc type to an HTML template or something. They've been really, you know, minimum effort uh, yeah. contributions. Some of them even say in the pull request, here's my pull request, give me my T-shirt, you know, kind right. of thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> where's my T-shirt? Uh, and so there was a bit of a... Uh, a brouhaha about this after a chap called uh, Joel Toms uh, wrote a blog post titled How One Guy Ruined Hacktoberfest 2020 Hashtag Drama um, and that attracted a lot of eyeballs and so it's been a bit of a drama for a couple of days. So I read that blog post with interest and the way these these pull requests weren't all coming from one person. No. no one no. person with a large, almost 700,000 subscriber YouTube channel posted a video about how to take part in Hacktoberfest and maybe have been a little bit encouraging in how to game the system. And a, no, a, a vast number of these pull requests two projects that featured in that video were basically the same pull request over and over and over again with the same description, the same changes. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and that's what, why they were sort of referred to as being spammy. Yes. And the individual behind that YouTube channel wasn't particularly apologetic or corrective in, you know, how he approached this to sort of try and persuade his audience to maybe not spam the projects with mm. hundreds of pull requests that they had to process. He did remove the video, which was one, one <laughs> he did, thing. Oh, he did. Uh, at the point I read it, that hadn't been done. So yeah. that's interesting. Yes. I actually I actually saw some people describe this as a, a distributed denial of service <laughs> attack against <laughs> open source maintainers. Right. Because people were having their inboxes filled with notifications for these pull requests which yeah. were just nonsense. And it, and it takes some, you know, cognitive load for you to yeah. deal with those. You know, you could say, well, it's just spam, delete it. But it's not. It's pull requests on your project and it yeah. clutters up your, your Git repo. Um, 
I mean, DigitalOcean reacted and they made the process a little bit more regimented and made it opt in. So you have to add a, a flag to your project to say you're part of this. In which case, if you don't do that, then you know these useless pull requests won't qualify. So fair enough. But it certainly does. Um, it rings bells with me because we've seen this in Ubuntu when we've tried to um, cast the net wide to get contributions. If there's any kind of reward, be it monetarily or swag, there are people on the planet who will do the absolute minimum and then demand their reward. Um, it's it's just a cultural difference between those people who think that everyone has got this egalitarian sense to contribute to open source and other people who just say, he said free t-shirt, what do I have to do? <laughs> what button do I have to press to make the t-shirt happen? And um, I think they need to think more carefully about how they run these in the future. But it, it, it needs us to think more carefully about how we engage with these people because that's a cultural difference between us and and these people. And, and if we want those people to be involved in open source, then we need to approach things differently and not just offer free stuff to get it done because it will attract the wrong people. Indeed. So, Mark, uh, what stories did you find about software buckling under the quantities of data? Well, uh, a, a story has been doing the rounds uh, in the UK press that Public Health England have missed a load of contact tracing records due to a dodgy uh, Excel import. Oh so what happened here was that uh, a load of data was being collected in CSV files, uh, as you do, um, and then they were imported into Excel uh, for processing, as you do. However... The file that they were imported into were uh, was a .xls format, which is the old um, Microsoft Office 97 format, not the more modern XLSX format. And the old one can only handle 65,000 rows of data in a single sheet. And you're telling us there was more than 65,000 rows? There was <sighs> about, I think, somewhere in the region of 15,000 more records than that, which should have been followed up for contact tracing and then weren't until this was discovered um, a few days later. Now, obviously, you know, this is bad for the reasons that it's bad, but, um, you know, you saw quite a lot of people saying, oh, well, you obviously don't use Excel for managing data and, oh, this is a stupid mistake. What what were they even thinking? But um, I don't think this sort of thing is, is probably as uncommon as you'd expect. Yeah. No, I've encountered this before. Uh, when I used to work in aviation, we had yeah. a means of dumping the black box flight recorders to CSV. Yeah. And of course, you load that into Excel and it blows past 65,000 rows pretty quickly because we're looking at tens of millions of rows of data. Yeah, yeah. And for that very reason, when we were looking, that isn't the way flight data is transmitted <laughs> around, but sometimes it's all you can do to like get at something that you need to look at. Yeah. Um, this is not for like accident investigation. This is for <laughs> uh, other kinds of monitoring. Um, but there, the, our solution was to use LibreOffice uh, to import the CSVs into LibreOffice, which could uh, accommodate those oh, could many it? millions of uh, rows of, of data no problem interesting the people who proclaim with authority that this kind of thing doesn't happen and oh these people are so silly for using excel are out of touch and they don't realize that normal people reach for you know when they need a hammer they reach for the nearest hammer and excel is a pretty spiffy hammer to be yep. reaching for and it has lots of features and people reach for it and they know it and they use it i've worked in large organizations where People all over the organization had special spreadsheets and they wouldn't share them. They were you know, <laughs> internal to that group. But every single part of the company had special spreadsheets somewhere. And once you started digging, you'd find loads of them all over the place mm -hmm. and people rely on it for business continuity. And if that spreadsheet went away or broke, yeah, the business would be hosed in some way. So it's, it's way more common than tech bros think. Uh, and there was one last news article that you found, Alan. Very exciting, this is. Uh, the I, I don't like the way it's framed, though. <laughs> the failed Ouya game console seeing work for mainline Linux kernel support. It didn't fail. Well, okay, it did. Um, well. So for those who don't remember, the uh, Ouya was a crowdfunded Android-based games 
console. I mean, it was a very small box. It was a phone without the display, basically. Um, had an HDMI port, plugged into the TV, came with a controller, and you could, it had a storefront you could install games from, uh, and you could play games. And I backed it on Kickstarter or whatever, and I used to play with it with my kids, and it was great little console. There were some games on there that we've now later purchased on Steam, and we still play to this day. There, there's some real belters on there. Um, and the kids loved it. Um, anyway, uh, it, uh, Ouya was sold to Razer, and then Razer shut down the um, the back-end storefront, so you can't download apps for it anymore. You can sideload Android apps, because it is Android under the covers. But an independent developer has been working to get mainline Linux kernel support for the Ouya game console. It's a NVIDIA Tegra SoC inside this little tiny box. But if you can get uh, proper Linux on it, you could potentially run proper games on this little thing, on this little Tegra GPU. Um, and it's got controllers, you know, already supplied that have radio. They're not, they're not wired. They're wireless controllers. So it'd be a nice little box to put under the TV. It's not super powerful, but for some games, you don't need super powerful. Mm. Maybe you could stream them from somewhere else or something. It's, it's a, it's a handy little, uh, little device. I do still like my, my Ouya. I still have it. Do you use it? No, it's currently in the loft. Um, <laughs> but it's not on eBay yet. No, the kids every so often do ask me, can we get the Ouya out and have a play with it? And, uh, you know, I haven't yet, but I may do. Okay. And what was their top game on the Ouya? So there were three. There was Towerfall, uh, which is fantastic multiplayer, same screen game. And there was one called No Breaks Valet. Ah, I remember we played that once, yeah. <laughs> no Breaks Valet is fantastic, where you, you come crashing in from the side of the screen and you have to try and hit the brakes, but there are no brakes. You've got to try and <laughs> steer the car into a parking slot and you like bump other cars out of the parking slots. And you get points at the end of the round for how many of your cars are in parking spaces and how many aren't. And the other one that I discovered through the Ouya was Bomb Squad. Oh, Bomb Squad is ace. Yeah, so it, it was really good at, all on screen uh multiplayer in the same room games it was it was just fabulous lovely and with that let's move on and i say move on but that is the end of episode 29 so if you would like to send us your great great feedback you can email us at show at ubuntupodcast.org or you can join our telegram chat ubuntupodcast.org slash telegram and if you are seeking a fine fine vps then head over to bitfolk.com who've been providing our vps since the podcast began and in fact it's the same instance that's been updated all the way from Ubuntu 606 to 1804. So in your face, Arch Linux users, it's a 14-year install. Go us. Thank you all for listening, and we'll speak to you next time. <laughs> <laughs>